I do believe we're on air. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our live debut episode of the Resurrected Word radio show. Here we will discuss various topics regarding the hidden scriptures. I'm in His Word, too, as your host. I would like to introduce to you my co-host, Angela Holmes. We met a while back when I was being interviewed by Apocryphal 1970. She recently joined our cause and fearlessly jumped in to help. A few months ago, I approached her regarding helping me to research and discover the many parallels that exist for the first book of Adam and Eve. Tell us, Angela. What inspired you to get involved, and why are you so eager to help? Well, like you said, um, when uh, you and Robert had aired the interview, I was, um, you know, before the interview had happened, I saw that he had posted, you know, special guest, and I thought, oh, I wonder who the special guest is, right? So I thought, well, I need to make sure I, you know, keep tabs on that. And then when it finally came up, um, you and Robert uh, were talking about so many things that were so very interesting to me. Um, one of the first things uh, you were talking about was uh, <clears throat> how Adam and Eve, um, you know, some people think that they were covered by skins that uh, that God had sacrificed an animal for them. And I had actually heard that too um, when I first started uh, studying the Bible at a church. Um, I remember one of the pastors has said that, yeah, God covered them with bloody skins. And then so after you said that, I thought, you know what, I need to start taking notes while they're um, while they're talking because some of this stuff sounds really important. And so um, I, you know, I made the few notes and then, you know, you guys had talked about the book of Enoch and I had read the book of Enoch uh, already. And as a matter of fact, um, that book... Um, was actually what pretty much changed my life. Um, it caused some sort of paradigm shift in my spirit, and I haven't been the same since I read that book. And my uh, my knowledge has expanded greatly um, concerning who I thought God was. Not only that, but Enoch was such a a lover of God and. You know, I've, I've read the Bible, and I've never really uh, come across someone with such a deep passion for God, you know, besides Jesus. And so um, it's kind of funny going back to Enoch. Um, you know, it talks about the fallen angels and the Nephilim in Genesis. And, and how I came across the book of Enoch was um, I was watching um, a show on History Channel uh, called Ancient Aliens, and I'd heard about it, and then I'd remembered seeing the name of that book on YouTube before, and I thought, hmm, that's a book I need to get my hands on. And so I went out, I picked it up, I read it really, really fast, and it was just incredible. And um, so um, after I read the book of Enoch, I decided that I needed to search more ancient texts because you know you you know you hear about books that are banned from the Bible and stuff like that and so um, I did a Google search for ancient text and you know I scrolled down and I noticed there was a um, a book called um, Adam and Eve and I was like hmm I wonder what that's all about and so um, I went and looked at sacred text and I started reading it and at first I felt like I was doing something wrong like I shouldn't be doing it. Oh, I understand. Uh, yeah, because you know so many people um that have been going to church for many years um they're it's like no, you can't read anything else. This is the only book you should read and and blah blah. blah. And so it was almost like this um religious spirit was attacking me. No doubt about it, because you can read uh, a text that uh, a pastor writes that's not canonized and be encouraged to read it, but yet um, read one of these ancient texts and and be attacked, you know, by not only your pastor, but by other members of churchianity. 
Yeah, and you know, it's, it was funny because when I was reading it, I actually felt like I was rebelling, but it felt like a good rebellion because after I'd read the Book of Enoch, I was really upset that it wasn't part of the canon um, because there's so much useful, important information in there that every believer should read. And, you know, after I started reading the book of Adam and Eve, um, I totally fell madly in love with them. Um, I felt so sorry for them. And, you know, Eve has a really bad rap. And this book um, that I read, uh, it really clarifies her remorse and her gratitude and her divorce and her devotion to the word. I was super humbled after reading their story and you know I bawled while I was reading it and I felt horrible I felt you know just so much emotion and you know it's funny because even that book it really made me even more thankful for the blood of Jesus because um, it's promised to us even in that book and right. then and then after Adam and Eve I started reading from the Nag Hammadi scriptures and so um, I guess I'm like super duper eager to help because I, I feel like I feel like there's been things that have been um, kept from us or hidden from us because of the authorities or the empire, the dark realm, the evil forces, whatever you want to call it. And so I am so excited to help get these texts out, get the word out. Um, I want to do everything I possibly can to help, you know, motivate and inspire people. Well, that's that's uh, that's the goal of of you and Robert and I alike. I mean, we all um, we put up these ancient texts, uh, narrations of them, and and sometimes even more than that, just to um, help people look at them. You know, if they're not for them, then you know they can they can switch the channel. Um, you know, but to but to at least give them a chance, because your testimony is that it has. If I'm not uh, going, you know, and speaking for you, your faith has actually been been uh, enhanced and deepened by by the reading of these scriptures. Is that correct? Absolutely. As a matter of fact. Um, just to kind of give you a, a a picture, you know, if you if you take your hands and put them on the sides of your head, kind of like blinders, like they do to a horse. <laughs> okay. Um, that's kind of how I felt with just the Holy Bible. Right. And then after I read the book of Adam and Eve, they kind of started going out at like a forty-five degree angle. The periphery. Right. Your peripheral vision was open. And then after I started reading the Lost Books and the Nag Hammadi and the Dead Sea Scrolls, I feel like I have no blinders on and I can actually see almost like in back of my head. And the expanse that has come over me is so amazing. I've been getting more visions. Um, my prayer time is more, oh my gosh, it's just rich. It's so rich because I feel like... God has opened this door to me that has never been opened before and it's a big door and I told you about that door it was like this yes, big crust of earth that opened up and you know I could see so much more paradise well you know um, what we're getting ready to discuss um, in our premiere episode that's upcoming is about the first book of Adam and Eve and um, so we'll get into that a little deeper about that vision that they lost when they were um, when their bright nature was taken from them and um, so that's going to be coming uh, up after a brief intermission but in the meantime I recommend um, everyone to go over to Angela's um, website, her YouTube site, uh, just type in Angela Holmes and she'll pop up and go check her out. She does have the Adam and Eve narrations of the first and the second book. If anyone would like to uh, listen to those, 
And uh, if you're interested in the Nag Hammadi scriptures, you can hear those there as well. Also, um, you might give her a, a sub because she's going to continue in this work. And you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of really excellent text being narrated by Angela. Her, uh, her voice is such a joy to listen to. And um, you'll really enjoy hearing her narration. So I encourage that. But for now, I think we're going to shut this particular um, upcoming announcement down and take a brief intermission. And we will be back um, in about 15 minutes. And Carol, thank you for having me. Yes, yes, and thanks for being here as my co-host. And, and we'll see you right back here in about uh, 15 minutes uh, or so. So be looking for us uh, just before 1 p.m. Eastern Standard. That would be what uh, Pacific time? It'd be about 9.45 Pacific time. About 9.45 Pacific time. Um, so just be watching for us. Stay tuned. And we're going to try to open up the uh, comment section. I think there's something like that on on this thing here, uh, it's like a question answer session for those of you who would like to interact with us. We're going to try to figure out how to work that on this uh, Hangout on Air for that episode. So give us um, about 15 minutes, about a uh, quarter till the hour, and we will uh, get back on the air and start uh, our discussion on the. Um, first book of Adam and Eve. Thank you all for listening, watching, commenting, and sharing. God bless you all. Welcome back, everyone. Um, this is In His Word 2 as your host and Angela Holmes as your co-host. Are you there, Angela? I am, and I'm so sorry for the delay. Oh, it's, it's quite all right. We're newbies at this. Everyone knows we're newbies at this, and, and I'm sure they'll give us some grace with that. Um, we will be uh, discussing um, the first book of Adam and Eve, and I'm having a little technical difficulty with my screen share um, at this point. Doggone it. Mm, I wonder how I'm going to get that up if I can't get my screen share to work. You got that up? Oh, yes, we do. We have cool. the picture of your family up. Now, do you have the Adam and Eve document on your computer? I don't have it open because I thought we were just going to go through the PDF. Well, that's what I mean, the PDF. Um, um, no, I don't, I, but I could probably get there. I don't have it. I mean, I can't seem to screen share. I don't know what's going on here. It's not letting me screen share now. Dog. Hmm. Well, we might have to save this we for... We may have to... Yeah, we may have to save it for another time. I don't know. Okay, uh, I think I'm back. Yay. I think I'm back. Ah, my screen share's back. Thank you, Jesus. Great, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So this is what we'll be uh, discussing, this particular book here. First book of Adam and Eve. I wish I had more than one screen share deal going on. And let me see. I need to open this in order to share it. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't know. Technical difficulties, people. We're, we're, we apologize for everyone listening. Um, we're really trying to get this... Uh, to work correctly. I'm going to hit refresh one more time and hopefully we can get this. Uh, I'm just going to pull the document up instead of putting anything else up. So bear with me. Bear with me, Angela. Thank you okay. for your patience. Sure, no problem. Okay, and I'm back. Great. Lord willing, this screen share will work this time. Ah, there's the document. Okay, here it comes. Can awesome. You see it okay? Awesome. Great job. Good job. All yes, right, I can. I can see it. 
All righty then, great. Um, and uh, this book, uh, when did you say you first come across this one? Um, I read this one probably, oh, I want to say about a year and a half ago. It was after I read the book of Enoch that I was searching for more ancient texts that I figured were kept hidden from me. And so, um, yeah, I found this one and I read it uh, as a text from ancient text. Right. I remember uh, the first time I uh, read this book and I was like you, I kind of felt like, oh my goodness, it's, you know, these are these are those texts they tell you don't read, you know, that there, that there can't be any truth in them. Um, and then I started reading this one and I'm like, wait a minute, the Word of God, that's Jesus. You the know? Word, you're the right, word. the Word. The Word. Yes, Jesus. What do we What do we got here? You know, and and I read it, and I probably read it two or three times, and then I was like, I I got to read this to my mom. She won't believe it. You know that that this even. You know, of course she does, but um, I I started reading it to her, and she was really blessed by it too. But um, let me see if I can um, play around with this document a little bit and. Give us uh, give us some of these little sticky notes here, because as we start out here in, in this first verse, on the third day God planted the garden in the east of the earth, on the border of the world eastward, beyond which, towards the sun rising, one finds nothing but water that encompasses the whole world and reaches to the borders of heaven. And I got to thinking, okay. Um, as I'm researching this document, what exactly um, happened on the third day? Let me look at the Bible and see if this is really backed up. And so then I find here in Genesis. You want to read that for us? Sure. Mm -hmm. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathered together of the waters called he sees. And God saw it was good, and God said, Let earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So they were, so God was actually, you know, uh, planting a garden on that third day, just like just like this book says, so we can pretty well uh, surmise that that's truth. At least the first verse is truth, right? Sure. As a matter of fact, when um, when we had uh, kind of come together and decided that we wanted to work on this project together, and I had printed out the whole book of Adam and Eve. <laughs> Um, right. From the computer, which you know, I probably should have just you know bought the book. But I'm glad we did it that way because then I was able to send you the manuscripts of the scriptures I found, and then you were able to go through it and find scriptures for yourself too. And I can't tell you how blessed I was um, doing this um, when I was going. You know, the first time I read it, first of all, it just really kind of penetrated my spirit and touched my heart and and made me kind of pity Adam and Eve. But then after I started going through it and really studying it, you know, I went through and I highlighted a bunch of stuff and then I went back and I, I referenced scriptures and I'm, I can't tell you how thankful I am for um, the computer and the search, you know, that we can do where we can just pop up scriptures where, oh, hey, you know, that reminds me of, uh, of this. I'm going to look it up and I've heard that in the Bible before, you know, and so right. that's how I was able to find um, the scriptures to put down in the original manuscript that I found for you, and then after I looked over it, I was so blown away because I think up ahead they're going to talk about Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, they do. Uh, actually, Enoch is mentioned in the second book of Adam and Eve, um, and I have a video coming out soon that's going to... Um, uh, 
highlight that, uh, the second book, what, what is said. Um, but that'll be, I don't know, maybe in a week or two I'll get that up. Maybe sooner, I don't know. I just don't know half the time where I'll find the time, and then I end up, I'm doing that today, you know? Yeah. I, I'm sure you do a lot of that, too. I do. But then we, uh, so we come into the next verse. And to the north of the garden, there's a sea of water, clear and pure to the taste, unlike anything else, so that through the clearness thereof, one may look into the depths of the earth. The sea of water. And so you start thinking, what about this sea of water? Do we know anything in the Bible? Have we heard anything ever before about that? And here... And he shewed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So there it is, right there in Revelation 22, verse 1. We're talking again about this sea of water, or the water of life. And um, later in, in, in this uh, book, on verse 3, it tells us, and when a man washes himself in it, he becomes clean of the cleanness thereof and white of its whiteness, even if he were dark. Um, and so I, I go on, and what did I find out about, uh, you know, this water? And it says in Ephesians... That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So, so this is this is true. There's something to be said about washing with the water, but the water is the word, and who is the word? Jesus. Right, right, and it says that here in John one fourteen. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, you know, blessing upon blessing in this book, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, you know, so, I mean, you can just go through this, and that's what I've done and what, what Angela has done to help me. In fact, she would find verses, uh, the, the Holy Spirit would, would grant her with particular verses as she went through the document and particular verses when I went through the document. And with the two of us, we've got a lot here in this uh, particular book. I've only made it through about just a little over the first ten chapters, and it is absolutely immense how this book so parallels the entire Bible. I mean, you can't just say that there's there's a verse in just one spot. Right. You know, um, it, it's just everywhere. I love it's this. So one. integrated. It really is. It really is. And I really love this, like in verse five, where it, where it talks about erasing the transgression that they had committed, and and to no longer be reminded of it, in the thought of their punishment, and to open up this little sticky note. Um, you remember the uh, sea of forgetfulness. Absolutely. I'm so well, thankful for it. <laughs> well, that's not exactly the way it's worded in our Holy Bible, but uh -huh. with these various scriptures that I've put up here, um, it, it gives you the, the picture of the Sea of Forgetfulness. You want to read those? For sure. Us um, Micah 7, 7.18 says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardon iniquity and pass by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retained not his anger forever because he delights in mercy he will turn again and will have compassion on us and he will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea Isaiah 43 25 says I even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins and Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Doesn't that just thrill your soul to hear that? Absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I get, I just, I'm so thankful that Jesus came 
and made a way for us. You know, that bridge back to the Father, that that way to have all our, our you know, we're sinners. I mean, you know, we don't actively participate in sin knowingly, but we sin daily, um, even perhaps without knowing. And Jesus knew that we were in an, an, in an impossible situation, that until he came and shed his blood and pardoned our sins, there would be no way for us to to have this relationship healed between you know, us and the Father. You're so right. And, you know, if it wasn't for grace, these things wouldn't exist. I know. I know. And his grace is sufficient for us and thank God for his grace it's it's you know I know that there are going to be people that make it that we had no idea was going to make it you know that's so funny that you say that his grace is so immense I was reading in the Bible yesterday was it John 10 10 I think it might have been John ten ten. Let me let me go there real quick. Okay, and you can uh, because it. I found something yesterday that I read out loud. Uh, uh, Reading out loud, okay. by the way, is awesome because faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. So oh. when you read out loud, it does something. It gets inside your spirit and. And it touches places that just your sight reading, you know, just reading to yourself, just can't touch. You're right. Okay, I found it. Um, so, you know, it's kind of funny when you get trapped in a little Christian bubble, you know, before you your mind expands. You think, oh, i got to save everybody so they don't go to hell, right? <laughs> well, um, I kind of... Ever since I started reading ancient texts, I think God's grace is much larger than I thought it was because um, now I when agree. I go back to reading the Bible after reading ancient texts, whoa, is it so much more full for me. So here, let me read you this real quick. Okay. And this talks about people that um, maybe don't necessarily believe in Jesus, okay? Okay. It says, I am the good shepherd. Oh, this is John uh, ten fourteen, by the way. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Right. Right, the reason absolutely. my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So what I was just so blown away yesterday because, you know, <laughs> I've, I can't tell you how many times I've read the New Testament. You know what I mean? And Every time I go back and reread it, something new pops out at me that I've never grasped before. And I don't remember reading that, you know, he has, you know, not just one flock. You know what I mean? Of, you know, just as the father, uh, let's see, um, I have other sheep right. that are not of this sheep pen. Right. So, well, I mean, how, how much grace is that right there? Well, I think that was where he was including the the non-Jews of the time. Wouldn't you agree? That was that was the ones, you know, my opinion is that the Jew those of the Jewish faith um didn't really want to include anybody else. You know, as far as you know, uh their faith, not really. I mean, they would allow people to join and believe in the one true God, but, but it wasn't like they evangelized ever. And so he wanted to make certain that they understood, his followers, his disciples, that it wasn't just open to them, that he was opening his grace you know, up for anyone and everyone who would want to follow him. Yes, I I agree. 
So I think that's what he was saying. It's not just the Jews, the 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 one peculiar people. It was open to all, all of his flock because he has a lot of flock out there that that was really lost through time and through relocation. You know, it's funny. Um, I guess I'm kind of. I I also can look at this other scripture in here in a different way too because um you know I've always wondered about well what about people in other religions you know do you know what happens to them and you know what about you know the Buddhists and the <laughs> Tibetans and the Brahmins and the Muslims and stuff and you know Jesus really only gives us two commands and that is love God with all your heart all your mind and all your strength and love Others, your neighbor, your neighbor as your love your neighbor. I mean, those are some, those are some pretty easy things to do if you think about it. You know, but, it's that's not hard of a thing to do. It's he he gives us so much grace and so much mercy that it's like, wow, you know, his his love is encompassing the whole world and it surpasses anything I've ever known before. It's more than my mind can comprehend, quite honestly. It, it really is because, you know, I as a as a woman and you as a woman, you know, we we've experienced some things that were unsavory, um, you know, ordained by men uh, or or committed by men, I should say, and um, you know, when you when you see that, it's it's kind of hard to, um, I don't know, open your mind to say you know gosh you know they're they're worthy of forgiveness and all and you know but we have to we have to forgive everyone sure yeah you know? otherwise you know because we've been forgiven so much if we don't forgive then then we're turned over to the tormentors we and get to it, suffer through that you know back to um the sea of forgetfulness that's the difference between god and man is that we can forgive, but we don't forget. Right. And so I think forgiveness is a continual process for all of us. It that really is. We have to is. constantly forgive. We we really do. In fact, any time um, someone who has done something to me, something wrong, comes into my mind, I just have to set it before the feet of Christ and say, "Lord, take this from me. I forgive them." You know, because I figure if it's coming into my mind. There's still a little bit of hurt left over, and I still have some forgiving to do. There's still something I'm not letting them them setting them free of. Sure, I think that's part of our human nature because that happens to me too. Like, um, for instance, gosh, something really bad happened to me um, in 2006 with a business where someone was um, embezzling um, from my company, and. Uh, you know, I, you know, got over it, but then, like, you know, weeks later, it was like, well, what about this? You know, what about that? You know, and I was like, <laughs> well, you know what, God, I already forgave that. Right. You know, why is that coming back into my mind again? And, well, there are evil forces in the heavenly realms, and that's where we're at. <laughs> well, and that, too, that, too, you know, the, the devil is, is continually uh, up at the, the throne room uh, laying accusation against us before the Father, you know, I mean, that's his thing, you know. So why wouldn't he bring it to us to try to knock us, put a stumbling block in our way, yeah. to, to make us doubt our faith or to make us doubt our salvation? I mean, how many of us out there doubt our salvation? You know, that's years? funny that, you, rem that uh, you bring that up because... I think that's one of the things that bothers me so much about uh, the corporate churches is that, you know, the pastor will stand in front of the congregation and he'll say, how do you know you're saved? Do you really know you're saved? And it's like, I think that that kind of question doubts, puts doubt in, in people and it put doubt in me um, right. at times, you know, when I knew that like I had had a spiritual experience with God and I'd had, you know, time in prayer and, you know, heard his voice and stuff. And even after that, I was like, are you sure you're saved? And it's almost like the enemy mocking uh -huh. uh, the people. And it really, really bothers me because once you 
decide to take that step in your life. That's just the first step. There's no going back after that. Once you're in his hand, there's nothing that can pluck you out of it. And exactly. so be it. Right. Right. Don't let anybody try to tell you you're not saved or um, because they see you messing up. You know, I mean, because none of us are Gosh, completely we all mess perfect. Up. None of us are completely perfect yet. We're going to make errors. Even though we try so very hard not to ever make errors, you know, not to disappoint our Father. Um, you know, we want to do our very best, but, you know, we are still human and uh, we haven't received our sinless bodies yet. You know, I mean, you right. know, we haven't we haven't received those yet. Uh, we we can't wait, but they're not here yet. And uh, so I do want to go on and see if we can get at least one chapter here. Um, uh, you know what? I'm then. I'm noticing that I think the next scripture that we're on is number six. Right. We, um, I kind of have something to say about the smell too. After we, wow, look at all that stuff you found. I know. Okay, I'm well, going to read. It, it reminded me of the book of Enoch when I was seeing the, 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 the delicious smell of the trees. Because Enoch remarked the same thing. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read and then I want to share something um, private. So um, it says, Revelation 22.2, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielding her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Enoch 24.3 says, And the seventh mountain was in the midst of these, and it excelled them in height, resembling the seat of a throne. And fragrant trees encircled the throne, and amongst them was a tree such as I had never yet smelled. Neither was any amongst them, nor were there others like it. It had a fragrance beyond all fragrance, and its leaves and blooms and wood wither not forever. And its fruit is beautiful, and its fruit resembles the dates of a palm. Then I said, How beautiful is this tree, and fragrant, and its leaves are fair, and its blossoms very delightful in appearance. Then answered Michael, one of the holy and honored angels who was with me and was their leader. Enoch 25, 1. And he said unto me, Enoch, why do you ask me regarding the fragrance of the tree, and why do you wish to learn the truth? Then I answered him, saying, I wish to know about everything, but especially about this tree. And he answered, saying, This high mountain which thou hast seen, whose summit is like the throne of God, is his throne, where the Holy Great One, the Lord of glory, the eternal King, will sit. And he shall come down to visit the earth with goodness. And as this fragrant tree, no mortal is permitted to touch touch it till the great judgment and he shall take vengeance on all and bring everything to its consummation forever it shall then be given to the righteous and holy its fruit shall be food its its fruit shall be for food to the elect it shall be transplanted to the holy place to the temple of the lord the eternal king so what i'm understanding from that was that this delicious tree, the delicious smelling tree, is actually in the Garden of Eden right now, but it's going to be transplanted to the temple of the Lord. Would I be right in, a, in, in gleaning that? What are your thoughts? Um, you know what's weird? Okay, so the other day I was reading to my kids and I was reading part of Genesis and if we go back to Genesis 1 2 or I'm sorry 1 12 okay. Genesis 1 12 and dang it I've got my NIV out I should be looking in my King James but let me just tell you this okay okay uh, okay and God said let the land produce vegetation seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it and according to the various kinds and it was so um, 
The land produced vegetation plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and the trees bring fruit with the seed in it according to their kind. And it was so weird because this like really popped out at me, and it said the trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And I don't know if this is kind of far-fetched or not, but I was thinking about the tree of life, right? and I thought its seed was within it. Okay, so it kind of reminds me of, you know, back in John 1.1 1, 1, when it said, um, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and in Him was the light of men. And it's almost like that light is a seed. Ah. And so, I mean, some people can say that, you know, okay, the new Jerusalem, you know, is going to be planted on earth, and that tree will be the glory of who God is. Is that what you mean? Um, well, when we get into that a little bit further, uh, we find that that tree is, like, at the center. It is the tree of life, I believe, um, that, that uh, Enoch is talking about, the tree of life. So God's radiance, I, um, I'll i share this too. Okay, so um, you had asked me if I would do a painting um, of the Tree of Life. And so I told you I would if I got a vision for it. Right. And, um, and you know I did. I got a vision for it. And I just want to explain something for a second. Um, so um, God gives me a lot of visions, and I'm so thankful that he does. It's just such a cool thing. So... The, let me explain the tree to you as I as I see it. Um, okay. I don't want to say that the tree is God because I don't think God can be confined to anything. Right. But I do believe, okay, so when I had my eyes closed, I saw the trunk of the tree, and the trunk of the tree um, had this... Um, almost like a clearness on the outside of just the trunk of the tree. And it opened up and kind of like umbrella. And it had like, all, it almost looked like these candies and things were dripping off of it. And then I saw this big, huge, kind of like gnarly tree, you know, with all these like <laughs> branches and stuff. And it was really awesome. And um, I felt like my vision was kind of limited, like it wasn't to its fullness. And, you know, um, I, I decided, you know, I, I need to start painting this, you know, because sometimes things will come to me as I'm painting too. Right. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to listen to um, Robert's um, Book of Enoch while I'm doing this because I, you know, I let my friend borrow the Book of Enoch like a year ago and I haven't seen it since. But um, I thought, well, I'll listen to Robert. Uh, read it, you know, and so I'm listening to Robert read it, and then all of a sudden he's starting to talk about the tree. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so cool, right? So <laughs> I was like, there's no coincidences, right? And no so, coincidences. And so um, I'm listening, and he's talking about how, you know, inside uh, the chunk of the tree there's like this fire, and, and talking about the colors and everything of it, and so because... God cannot be contained to something. I believe that his power can definitely be in something, and I do believe that his power and his beauty and his loveliness and kindness and joyfulness and everything that he is, all the wonderful things that he is, I think that that will be the food that we eat that nourishes and sustains our spirits, our our body of bone and flesh, you know what I mean, uh, right. in, in paradise, so that we can partake in him besides just partaking in the fellowship of Jesus. Well, I, I tell you what, it's, it's going to be wondrous, wondrous, wondrous. It'll be beyond anything we've ever comprehended. I, I, I'm certain of that, too. Really can't wait. Me, too. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great. It's really uh, neat, too, Carol. Um, lately, um, you know, you know I've been going through kind of a rough time lately. Right. And, you know, I've been trying to just spend a lot more time in prayer because that's the only thing I can do when I 
I, I don't know what to do, you know, and so when I don't know what to do, I, I get down, you know, and I, I, um, I, I search for him and I, he's been showing me pieces of paradise that are so wonderful. It's just, he's so good to me. I'm so thankful that, that, um, he shows himself to me. Well, I know that, uh, that obviously something notable is uh, to be said about these particular broadcasts because you and I both have encountered, uh, well, a good month of delay because uh, we had planned to, planned to start these hangouts on air um, in the month of January. And then, right. of course, I ended up with no power. <laughs> through the freak snowstorm that we had and um, then you had your other uh, things that occurred in your life, little stumbling blocks thrown out in our path and um, we're just thankful to finally be here. I know it's the 2nd of February before we got started but you know all things in God's good timing it seems that we had to have a delay so that we could think through um, some more things, such as uh, we would like to come uh, and be do this hangout on air at uh, it would be 12 noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, um, every Sunday, as as often as possible. Um, there will certainly be some Sundays that we won't be able to share with you. Um, I just remembered something that um, I'm sorry to interrupt real quick, but when um, we're talking about the fragrance of the trees, right? Oh, okay. So back when I was like four or five, um, my mom took me to church for the first time, and um, she was trying to take me to you know go sit in Sunday school with some other kids, and I was totally freaked out and I wouldn't go. So she brought me into um, the sanctuary um, at this church that she went to um, called um, Harvest in Riverside, California. And um, worship had already started, and I remember walking in and smelling a smell that was unlike oh, yeah. any smell I had ever smelled in my entire life. And I remember just thinking the smell smelled so clean and so beautiful, and I was like, oh my gosh, this place smells so awesome. But come to find out, um, I didn't go back to church again until I was 10, but I went to the same one, and I smelled that smell again. And it felt like God was almost like tapping me on the shoulder going, that's me, that's what I smell like. And wow. then, um, And then when, um, you, know, uh, you know, the pastor was... Um, was calling for you know people to come up and if you'd like to give your heart over to Jesus you know come up and it was so weird because I was so overwhelmed by the smell that it kind of made me like cry for like no reason and I'm 10 okay I'm 10 years old right and then all of a sudden you know like there's all sorts of people going up giving their lives to Jesus you know and then all of a sudden I felt like I was sitting on this really big hand like a big hand and it was trying to push me off the pew where I was sitting and I was like fighting it really hard. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get up there and go with all those people. It's like embarrassing. I don't want to do this, you know. And I was just crying. I didn't know why I was crying. <laughs> and I felt this hand push me up and I was the very last one to walk up there and I remember the pastor looked me dead in the eye and he said, God bless you, child. And I really feel like because he said that to me at such a young, impressionable age that I really believed that I was blessed in some certain way. And I believe we're all blessed individually in our own ways. But because he looked at me right in the eye and said that, I thought, oh my gosh, this is something really special. And although my parents didn't follow through going to church, I, can, I continued to smell that smell in certain places and mm. I know that that is the smell of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And that is what 
drew me in originally. Now, I don't know what draws other people in. I would love to hear other people's stories about how they decided to give their life to God, and I hope they do share on comments and things like that because that is what happened to me when I was young. Well, I think it's time that we kind of wrap this up. Um, it's been great talking with you, Angela. It's always so wonderful to talk to you too, Carol. I love you so much. I love you too. And um, I want to do this again uh, Sunday um, at about, like I said, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. And we will do our best to um, open up the chat feature, um, the question answer feature. We, we're still real newbies at this. So everyone give us grace and if you have some suggestions please put them in the comment section um, once this posts onto YouTube to um, you know if you know something how something works uh, maybe you could even see, send us an email um, because right now my screen share is not even working it's uh, I think I'm back to I was wondering what happened icon. Yeah, I don't even know what's going on with it. Um, so we really have to close things down for right now. Um, Lord willing, everything will work better next broadcast. Um, and uh, absolutely, but it's but I think we covered a lot of really good topics today, and should give some people some food for thought. And um, you know, Angela, I encourage you to come to my page uh, when this video uploads. You know, periodically check it and see if someone directs a question to you. Um, okay. Because, uh, you know, I would like you to share just real quick before we close. Um, why should others get involved with um, the seeking out? <clears throat> of the hidden scriptures. Sure. What has it done for you? Um, well, first of all, um, if you're passionate about the kingdom of the Most High God and have a desire to share with others the many mysteries and wonders of the Word, then I encourage others to read aloud ancient texts that have inspired them. Words are powerful and they are life. Sharing the word brings forth life, and Jesus says in John 10.10 10, that he comes so that um, we may have life and have it abundantly. And, you know, it's kind of funny because this also reminds me, and I don't mean to get, I don't want to get lawful right now at all, and I don't want anyone right. to feel like they are under subjection to, oh my gosh, I have to do this now. You know, you don't. Um, your ministry and what you do in your life is 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 your own thing you know um, I just people that love to read um, that you know want to share they should do it but um, going back to me saying that I don't want to sound lawful I I do want to um, reflect on something that you told me about one day okay. and it had to do with um, the the ten minyas in Luke 19 um, I was super blown away by your interpretation of that parable. And so um, you had kind of reiterated that parable to me in a different way than I learned it. The talents? Um, the parable yes. of the talents? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so all it is is pretty much saying don't, don't hide don't hide what you have to share. And right. so who, whoever is listening, share your light um, because it does encourage others and it causes ripple effects. Right. Because, you know, one candlelight can light a little spot. But then your candlelight and someone else's candlelight and, and we all start shining our lights out to and for the world. It's going to lighten the whole world. It's gonna, it's gonna set the world on fire. <laughs> um, it will set the world on fire. You know, we all have to get involved, and we all have to, to do our part. Even though, you know, I may feel like a pinky in the body of Christ. You know, uh, someone else may be as charismatic as, as an arm or a 
leg, you know. I mean, all of us have our parts in the in the family of God, in in the body of Christ. So we all need to do what we can not to bury our talent under the earth, not to um, snuff out uh, what God has given to us. We need to share. It's Absolutely. very important because what you share, Angela, and what I share and what others share, it serves to encourage us in our faith. For sure. And to and and to cause us to grow as a spiritual body, you know, with Christ as our head. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, after, you know, during the time I read the book of Enoch and um, Adam and Eve, I wasn't going to church at all. Right. I, 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 I quit going. I moved hundreds of miles away from my church, and I, I just couldn't find a church. And um, I, I tried like five different churches here in town, and I just felt like I couldn't find my fit. But it didn't cause me to stop reading the Bible and praying and, you know, worshiping God. Um, but I will say that these books have helped me to kind of dig deeper with God, you know, it's like, yes. I, I want to know Absolutely. more, I, I want more of God, I'm hungry, and the more I read this stuff, the hungrier I get. No doubt about it, me too. And did you have another part to that question that I didn't answer? Um, I think I've got it, I don't think that I'm showing up on this at all, there I am, okay, I thought that I was broken, I <laughs> <laughs> so I am broken. Anybody that knows me knows I'm pretty broken. <laughs> but um, we do have more episodes coming soon. Um, we're going to try to be here for you every Sunday as the Lord allows it and um, as we're able to do it. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them on the video. And uh, Angela and I will do our very best to respond to whatever your concerns are. We thank you for watching and Angela would you like to uh, say anything more? Yeah um, I just want to thank you so much for um, making that video with Robert um, originally because it was the catalyst to get me moving on reading ancient texts and so I just appreciate the two of you I I have never met Robert yet but um, I hope to meet him in the future and um, you have been such a great and wonderful friend to me and I just appreciate you so much thank you so oh, much I thank God for meeting you because you have been such an encouragement to me and and that's what we want to be to others that want to join our cause we we want to be here for you. We will help you, encourage you. Um, you know, we want you to be a part of this movement. That uh, we agree that that God has put a lot of jewels out here for us to find, but it is up to us to to look into them. We can't look at them like they're evil, because anything can be used for evil purposes. I mean, even the Holy Bible. Look at Waco. Look at Heaven's Gate. Look at the Georgetown massacres. I mean, even the Holy Bible has been used for evil. So you have to look at, at each text out there with the discernment of the Holy Spirit. If you're not using it for evil, the Holy Spirit will, will uh, reveal the divinity within it. You know, and we just encourage you to, to get over your fear of this. Um, if if that's what's stopping you from reading it, you know, just um, just do your best to uh, you know give it a chance, give it a chance, and let the Lord help you with uh, the understanding of whatever text you're reading. You know, especially in this information age we're living in right now. I mean, we're living in some really spectacular times. We have the world at our fingertips. No doubt about it. We can Google search anything and pretty much find an answer to anything that we're looking up, you know. And I believe that there is a big movement with these ancient texts coming because, you know, people are super hungry besides for just the Bible. There, It's like there's, there's something just 
there's something else out there. There's something that we're missing, you know, and these books have satisfied a a a thirst and a desire that I have longed for for a really long time. And I hope that this I hope that these stick these texts are able to not only, you know, quench that thirst in you but also to refine you and help you to go through the fire and become more pure. No doubt about it. Well, I'm going to close this live broadcast now and um, everyone out there that uh, watches and listens, please remember us in your prayers and we will yes. do our very best to get better at this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, because we're so totally newbie at it, um, we're still stumble ar stumbling around trying to learn how to do these things. So Yeah, it's nice and raw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for watching, listening, commenting. God bless you all. Thank you. Bye-bye, Angela. Bye.